Hi, it's Dr. Sandy Laura Kramers. Thank you again for joining me for podcast number, I don't remember, we'll, we'll figure that out. Anyway, I just wanna to talk to you today a little bit about all the treatments in the world for dry eye, which requires quite a bit of fortitude to go through. I have a bunch of videos on YouTube that go through short parts of this. I remember one time I had a patient that uh, came in, had seen a lot of uh, different ophthalmologists around the country, and I showed him this stepladder, which many of you have seen this, all the treatments in the world. And he said, are you kidding me? <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm just trying to provide information. And I tried to explain a little bit of what was going on. So uh, when I was in Boston, I had a bunch of patients say, could you put just all the treatments on the, you know, in the world on one sheet? And when I was a uh, young attending and even a, a resident, all we had to help with symptoms that of things that hurt your eyes, like burning, tearing, reflex tearing, mucus, blurry vision, uh, pain, dryness from gland issues or aqueous issues like tear deficiency or what we call dry eye, which is really a misnomer, but that term, all we had was warm compresses, artificial tears, and restasis. That was it. Then Lipiflow came along. And so it took years before anything else really came along. Even the fact of omega-3, do you take omega-3? Does it help? Does it not? Still very controversial. So I tried to put everything on one sheet, but it required a lot of fortitude. And I realized that's not an easy thing, right? It's not a lot of patience, you know, you know having these kind of virtues to be patient, to deal with something that's a chronic problem can be very tricky. And so what happened yesterday, a friend of mine told me this great story, which I wanted to share with you because I found it very helpful. She said, you know, Everybody around you is looking on how you, everybody, you know, myself and everybody, how you deal with things, how you deal with adversity. Your kids are constantly watching you. You're watching your parents. You're watching your colleagues. You're watching your coworkers. Your coworkers are watching you. Your friends are watching you, etc. We always try to see and learn from every person to pick a pearl of how they deal with certain things or how they deal with a certain situation. You know, if somebody cuts you off on the highway, do you curse or do you make excuses for them? Or you say, oh, maybe they're, you know, mother's sick, or we always joke, maybe they're late for mass, or we always kind of joke about that. So how do you deal with adversity? And so, you know, she said a friend of hers um, had recently died and they went to the funeral and the son told the story about his father, who was 85 years old or so, who died a few weeks ago. And it wasn't of COVID, it was just, you know, he was old. Um, so basically what happened was he had been a very cheerful man his whole life. He had many, many kids, a very happy marriage, and he lived by himself. He, I think he was widowed uh, and he lived by himself. And so he felt really bad. He felt really horrible and he knew he had to go to the emergency room right away. So he called 911. The ambulance came, they took him to the emergency room. He was able to call his family and say, you know what, I think you guys need to come to the hospital. And so everybody was in the ER and everybody had a mask and the attending physician comes in and says, so how are you feeling? And he takes off his mask and he goes, fabulous. And he died 30 minutes later. And his son told the story, I suspect, to show the kind of life this man led, led and how, the death he led. And so I thought that was very beautiful because a lot of what we deal with in medicine and in life is the long haul. How do we deal with those small issues and big issues that can be very, very difficult to deal with, especially if they're chronic conditions like dry eye. And so the point of this is to kind of try to get you ready for this information that I'm gonna kind of tell you about, because it is quite a lot of information. And, and in a way I say, thanks be to God, because years ago we had nothing. You've heard my story of Dr. Foster at Harvard, who basically told me, don't ever send me another dry eye patient, because there was nothing we had, but now we have a lot. So. As you all know, you've seen, so many of you have seen my big overwhelming step ladder with all the treatments in the world. We've updated it thanks to a couple of our interns, uh, Aviva Lund and Susie um, Shiskow. Uh, so I'm going to show you this. So this is our new one. We're going to put it on my blog and it is a lot of information, but I want to kind of show you how we're doing this. So these are all the treatments in the world for dry eye. And these are all the treatments in the world for allergy that affect the eye. And they overlap like we've talked about many times. So the key component of this is still those two pathways. The first pathway that's crucial is to save those meibomian glands and really all the cells of the eye. But the one we can see right now is the meibomian glands. And you guys have seen this picture 
of what a normal mybography should look like with the white piano keys that represent the kind of normal oil and how we get older the glands can dry up and we do not want that we all dry up as we get older everybody dries up maybe women more faster maybe than men depending on your profession we say now but we all dry up because of inflammation and inflammation is really the root cause of death of the cell and death of us uh, in general so those, those are kind of the things that i want to talk about so the most important is to save the glands because the glands are key to not having pain washing out allergens lubricating the eye keeping the watery part of the eye the the part that comes from the tear film of the lacrimal gland the aqueous part the watery part it keeps it on the eye so it doesn't evaporate too quickly so that's why the glands are so important and in the yellow are all the treatments to save the glands that have been published still the same since my last podcast Warm compresses, that which includes kind of blinking. Heat is the only way to open the orifice and blinking, crucial. So as you hear me on, or you listen to me on uh, the, the YouTube or, or listen to me on your podcast, close your eyes if you can, blink. The more your eyes are closed, the less inflammation. The more you're blinking, you're milking that oil just like you milk a cow. And that is crucial to keep the oil pumping. So taking breaks at the screen, ideally every 10, 20 minutes, looking 10, 20 feet away uh, for 10, 20 seconds. And I say 10, 20, because it used to be the 20, 20, 20 rule, but I have many patients that really need to take breaks more often than that. So it depends on your mybography score, how often you should be taking breaks, how often you should be on the screen. That goes for adults and especially for children. So if somebody like we talked about before has almost no glands left, whether it's a child or an adult, we know screen time for them right now is a big no-no. We want to limit that as much as we can. Uh, this includes the cleaning, so the lid hygiene routine, the warm compresses, the cleaning. Almost all of us have bacteria and sometimes mites called Demodex on the eyelashes, and there's many ways to clean them off. They're my favorite are diluted tea tree oil, as of today, Avanova and Optase tea tree oil wipes and Cleardex. Those are my favorite ones. And within probably an, another few months, there'll be some more coming out, but you're looking for things that say kill Demodex because we just want them away from our orifice of the meibomian gland. And this is what we understand in 2021. It's going to change. We're going to understand more as time goes on, but this is what we have right now. So uh, keeping the eyelids clean is super crucial. Doing the warm compresses 15 minutes twice a day is the minimum. If you can do more, do more. You don't want to make it too hot. You don't want to burn the skin. There's some question about what's the perfect temperature. You know, we want it less than 113 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, we don't want to burn the skin, but the be more heat, the better. But heat makes rosacea and sometimes patients' skin red or, or very irritated so you have to balance it and you may need cold compresses after the heat to protect your skin we don't want to hurt the skin the second is the thermal pulsation we've talked about before lipoflow or mybo uh, which is a new one or the next one the ilux they're all coming out now which are trying to milk the oil to get the oil pumping again and these are usually in-office procedures hopefully within a few years we'll have something in in your house you can do Intense pulse light has been a game changer because it really does work. It's a bright light that we put along the eyelid and it decreases inflammation, which we love. It kills Demodex, it improves collagen, it opens the gland, liquefies the oil and allows us to express the oil under the microscope and video camera so patients can see the quality and quantity of their oil. And that is truly priceless because it tells us what's gonna happen in the long term and how often we need to do the warm compresses or how often we have to do IPL and then the last one is the meibomian gland probing. That is something where we go into each gland with a special small probe, no needles, but it is uncomfortable, it's expensive, not FDA approved, but it does work. So we're trying to break open scar tissue and then with either IPL or repeat probing or warm compresses, keep the oil pumping with blinking. And we have inserted into the meibomian glands platelet-rich plasma, autologous serum, of course, steroids, cord blood serum, and stem cells. So we're looking to see how to regrow those glands. And we think we can, but we just need those cannulas, which are still not available. Okay, so everything else on this kind of new stepladder is for symptoms. And we categorize this a little bit more clear into drops, ointments, and other options. So people can start to think about, okay, what do I wanna do? What do I feel comfortable with? What do I want? What's covered by insurance? What's not? What's experimental? What's not? And so by going through these, it kind of helps you understand what you can do now when you feel your eyes. So if you feel your eyes or you know somebody that has red eyes, please do something. Tell them, don't let this one wait. This is not one of those conditions where it will go away necessarily because most people get worse with aging. The number one complaint in older people around the country, around the world, is dry eye symptoms, pain, burning, itching, and it's miserable to see a 90-year-old person in the prime of their life or you know, kind of maybe the last years of their life 
really un unhappy because of their eyes. So we want to save that problem and try to decrease that risk. So briefly in the drops, artificial tears over the counter. We want non-preserved artificial tears. You can read through the options with Lacrosert and all the different options that are available. Lumify helps decrease redness, but we don't like it because that's preservative. So there's all these different things you can read about. There's the FDA approved drops, which are non-steroidal and of course the steroid drops. So we love steroids, but steroids have risks. They all have a preservative, which we don't like. They can make uh, the condition of glaucoma a risk by increasing the pressure and they can increase your risk of cataract. So anybody who needs steroids four times a day in terms of drops for two weeks comes in to get their eye pressure checked no matter what because that's we're trying to catch whether the pressure is spiking which it can in probably about 60 percent of patients and so the non-steroidals that are FDA approved are Zydra, Restasis, Sequa. We've gone through those before. You can check out my other videos. They're non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. They do work. They all burn. They burn. They all cause redness. It's just what it does. If you cannot stand it, we go to the biologics. We love the biologics because it's usually a patient's own cell, like their serum, their platelet-rich plasma. That platelet-rich plasma is the same kind of product that Kim Kardashian used for her vampire facial. People inject into joints now to try to decrease the risk of surgery or even decrease surgery. They work. We have had them uh, very successfully helping patients. We also use amniotic membrane drops, amniotic membrane, core blood serum, and stem cells. So those are the next generation that really needs to be researched with randomized control prospective studies. But as you can imagine, there's really minimal money in this because it's you can't put this on a shelf and sell it. This is your own cell. So it does work, but they're not covered by insurance and they are expensive in some cases. And then the other category are things like Oxervate, DNA, IVIG, Lacritin, DHEA. Those are the new category of, of medicines and drops that are trying to kind of help with the inflammation. Um, but again, we don't have any randomized controlled studies on them. Uh, a lot of insurances won't cover it. You have to find a compounding pharmacy. Ointments, there's the natural over-the-counter ointments like coconut oil, manuka honey, olive oil, mineral oil. The risk of those really is minimal. I've not seen an infection yet, but it's probably been reported. The concern is that if you don't wash it off, maybe you're covering the orifice of the meibomian gland and that oil cannot get out properly. So make sure you wash it off if you're using it at nighttime or if you're using it during the day, make sure there's a period of time where you are washing it off and then blinking, trying to get that oil to come out. But this ointment is trying to do two things. Number one, lubricate the eye. Number two, suffocate the mites and bacteria that are on our eyelashes. So those two things are really helpful. And then manuka honey is kind of like a natural infection anti-inflammatory coconut oil as well and then the prescription ointments which are steroid type and non-steroid type we usually start with the non-steroid type and if they don't work we do the steroid type if somebody doesn't have glaucoma and so in the sheet everything in red is a steroid because we want to make sure you're aware to watch out to not use it too often if you can try to avoid it and so anything we give patients, we tell them, if it makes you worse, let us know. It's probably an allergy to either the preservative or the actual chemical. And then the other options are the kind of natural things like your diet. We've talked about that many times, trying to just work on the long haul of having an anti-inflammatory diet. We still think omega-3 is helpful, even though there's been some papers to say, yes, it's good. No, it's not good. Things like doxycycline uh, are an anti-inflammatory, trying to decrease inflammation at 20 milligrams a day is an anti-inflammatory. At 100 or 50 even, it could be an antibiotic, which can mess with your gut flora, but at 20 milligrams, it doesn't. And we really love doxycycline, as long as you're not allergic or sensitive to that. Things like uh, steroids, we try to avoid pills, that is, uh, gabapentin, naltrexone, those are kind of uh, immunomodulatory uh, agents that help in some patients, but it's one of those last resorts in general because it's not really getting to the base of the problem as far as we can tell from studies. Things like punctal plugs, we love punctal plugs. It's a little cover over the drain that keeps the tears in the eye longer. And that's assuming your tear is not full of inflammatory factors. So if you have rosacea, uh, you may get worse with punctal plugs. And the only way to know whether you will like them or not is by putting them in. And there's four places to put them in. We sometimes will try the bottom two or just one eye. Uh, and the risk is basically that you'll have too much tearing or you'll have foreign body sensation. You can feel it. The risk of infection is incredibly rare. I've, I've only once seen a plug get stuck, which was actually uh, two days ago, and we had to actually try to surgically remove it, but it's really rare uh, in terms of infection or it getting stuck. Other things like scleral contact lenses do help in terms of trying to get through your day. 
Contact lenses, whether they're bandage contact lenses or scleral contact lenses, have a double-edged sword. They make you feel better, you have good vision, but eventually over time it will limit your ability to use them because it does decrease my booming gland cell function over usually a period of years and it does affect those goblet cells which produce the mucin. So they do affect the cells in a negative way so it's kind of a double-edged sword. Lid tarsorophy, trying to lift the lid if you have too much white under your pupil, we do that as well if needed. And then pain specialists, if we, if we find a patient is just not getting better with anything and we've tried everything, we talk, of course, in, you know, to, to people that can help us because we don't want you to live in misery and pain. So we want you to be able to find the help you need either with your ophthalmologist, with us, or with somebody that knows more about how to control central pain if you have a neuropathy, for instance. So these are the key things I hope you'll share with you know, your friends, family, and for yourself. If you have any questions, please let me know. I hope this was very helpful. And thank you for tuning in. Please subscribe to my podcast and please share it with your family and friends. Encourage them to blink frequently, wash their face morning and night with warm water and avoid screen time and try to just hang in there for the long haul as we get through uh, this these next few years of COVID. Thank you.